Father God, we just ask that you would just come into this place, come into our hearts right here, right now, and speak to us. That we are, we're just so honored to be in your house, that we could come and worship you. God, just speak to us. Let us, let us be open to what you, the message that you have for us today. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How many of you remember the uh, What Would Jesus Do bracelets? The WWJD, right? You guys remember? Who had one of those? Well, if you don't have one on right now, there are a bunch out at the uh, desk as you leave today. Pick your favorite color. I got the journey green one, of course. And it asks the question, right? What would Jesus do? But as we, as we work into the, this, this series on Galatians, we're in the second half of the second chapter of Galatians. I don't want to answer the question of what would Jesus do, because there's a lot that Jesus would do. I would rather answer the question, what would Jesus undo? Like what, 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 not like what he's created, because he, what he has created is perfect, and he wouldn't undo any of that. What would Jesus undo in our lives? Like, like what is something in our lives that absolutely just grieves the heart of Jesus? What is the one thing in our lives that if, if he could just undo it, which he can, but we'll get there. If you were to undo it, it would just make everything about our lives and your lives and my life better. And so we're in Galatians chapter 2, and we come across this issue that oh, is just so far, far too common in this world. It's far, it's far too common, especially in the church world. So I want to tell you a story as we get into it, because it's not a fun topic to talk about. So I, in, my, in my morning commute, there is, um, I, I, I drive my son to school, my incredible seven-year-old, and I drive him to school and I drop him off, and then I, as I'm leaving, there's this opportunity for me to leave the school zone, and I'm at a stop sign, and I have to take this left-hand turn onto a road that is much busier than the road that I'm on. They're going much faster than I'm going. And so, you know, I try to get out there, and with enough, you know, you're kind of playing Frogger, you got to get out there, and, and, and it's early in the morning, there's a lot of people on the road, and sometime last week, I, uh, I, I pulled out, and I thought I had plenty of room. And then I instantly realized that the car, who may or may not have been going like 100 miles an hour in a 45, was coming right up behind me. And they were very disappointed with my driving capabilities. So much so that they decided to alert me of my inconsistencies and in quality of driving that they slammed on a very loud horn. Now, uh, being the man of God that I am and my repentant self and you know I had messed up and so I decided to give them the international sign of my bad hand raised head down my bad they did not um they did not take that as an apology they didn't think that was good enough and so as they uh sped around me they gave me the international sign of go straight to God uh peel the banana look, read between the lines you get it now uh, I had messed up, right? I mean, I can either confirm or deny that they were speeding, but, uh, you know, I had pulled out in front of them. That was my bad. Until, as they passed me, I realized that they had a bumper sticker on their car. A very distinct bumper sticker on their car that had the Journey foot on it, and they were from the Journey Church. And then I instantly realized, I said, that is a person that I pastor at the island campus. I know who that is. And so I decided right there in that moment that God had placed me and uniquely created me. Hashtag last week. Hashtag go back and listen to last week's message. Uniquely created me and put me in that position to, you know, remind him of what he had done and who he had on the back of his car. And so, you know, if, if nothing else, just to return him to a right standing with God. And so, you know, because he had sinned against, not only against God, but against his pastor. And so I sped up, may or may not have been speeding at that point, to get up to them next to the light. Now, when I got up next to the light, next to them at the light, uh, I have dark tint in my car. So they couldn't tell who it was. And they were still very disappointed in my driving capabilities as I drove up. But at this point, I already know what's going on. And so I just hit the auto, like, roll down. I crossed my arms. And I smiled at them. As, their, as, as the, my window went down, their face turned from anger to horror. And then they gave me the international sign of repentance and said, my bad pastor. To which I said, you know... It was my fault for pulling out in front of you. I love you. I'll see you on Sunday. 
What would Jesus undo in our lives? Now, before we get into that, though, I, I do feel like I have to mention, if you have a journey sticker on the back of your car, or maybe you're wearing a journey shirt, or both, like this person was, just don't, okay? Just don't, okay? Be better. What would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo any behavior. He would undo any pattern. He'd undo any attitude in our lives that he absolutely couldn't stomach, that he absolutely despised. See, I believe that Jesus would undo hypocrisy. That is, claiming to be one thing and then living like another. Jesus would undo hypocrisy in our lives. Now, I want to ease into this because this is not necessarily an easy topic to touch on. And frankly, it's really easy to see hypocrisy in other people's lives, but it's very difficult to see it in our own lives. Like, let me ask you a question. Show of hands. How many people would say that they know somebody who's a hypocrite? It's okay. How many people would say that that person is sitting right next to them? Don't raise your hands. Because they could absolutely point right back at you. Why? Because it's so easy to see hypocrisy in other people, but it's so difficult to see it in ourselves. And honestly, in my opinion, I believe this is a subject that we we pastors have kind of mistakenly dismissed and belittled because, well, there's, there's sort of this pastoral joke. Maybe you've heard this before. Like, we get this objection from people. They say, well, I'm never going to go to your church because your church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, to which we, us pastors, we reply, we say, well you know, you might as well join us. There's always room for one more. And, and you know, we kind of laugh, and they kind of laugh, and it's sort of funny, but there's sort of a little bit of truth in there. But honestly, what I think it does is it realistically dismisses the real pain that people have that have been caused and the hurt that's been caused by people who claim to follow Jesus. Like, what, what would Jesus undo? Well, he would undo hypocrisy. See, I believe, I believe, That the single greatest cause of atheism today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. It's been my experience that this is frankly what the unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable about Christians, that we would do such a thing. And so I want to give you a foundation of what hypocrisy is, and I want to do that by telling you what hypocrisy is not. See, hypocrisy is not the disparity between what we do and what we wish we did, right? It's not the difference between how we behave and how we wish behave. It's not like, like, I wish I didn't say those things, but I said those things. I wish I didn't treat my pastor that way on the road, but I treated him that way on the road. I wish I didn't do those things, but I did them. No, that's just sin. It's not hypocrisy. What hypocrisy is, is the gap between what we show and who we are. It's the difference between how we live and how we actually are. It's the public persona versus the private character. See, Jesus, I believe, would undo what I call the show. That is the show when the show, what you're putting out to people, is not consistent with what and who you actually are. In fact, whenever Jesus would rail on people and rail on this idea of hypocrite, like a hypocrite, he would, he would use this word called, as a Greek word, it's called hypocrites. It's hypocrites. It even sounds like hypocrite. It's where we get the word hypocrite from. What it is, is if you've ever been to a play, it's a Greek stage player who wears a mask. And it actually, it looks just like this. I brought one of these today. It's a little bit creepy, but you know, Halloween's coming up. This is literally, if you've ever been to a theater, I've been to a play, this is literally a hypocrites. There's actually usually one and then another one, like an angry and a, like tragic. If I, if I preached like this for the rest of the time here, this would be a little bit creepy, But it's actually what Christians do all the time. They act one way without a mask around certain people, and then they put the mask on, and it changes not only how they appear, but who they actually are. Now, that's not a problem just for us. This was a problem way back then, like way back in Jesus' time. And so we're talking about Galatians chapter 2, and there is a problem in the second half. Look at this. Look at this up on the screen. This is incredible. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face because he stood condemned. He's like about to go down, right? This is Paul talking. And so he says, before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, this Cephas character. But then when they came from James, he separated himself. Basically, when the Jews showed up on the scene, they separated himself. And the rest of the Jews acted so hypocritically along with them. So much so that Barnabas, who we know from last week, was a pretty good guy, a co-worker of Paul, was led astray by what? Their hypocrisy. 
and I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. See, right out of the gate, you have to know there's beef. You have to know there's an issue. Because Paul calls Peter Cephas. Like Peter had been Peter up until this and all through all the all the parts of the chapter, but Paul's about to throw down, and so he calls him Cephas. That's kind of like your mom like using your full like long government Christian name, like when she yells at you, like Ryan Michael Weber, you come down these stairs right now because I'm gonna spank you so I mean she would never have said that, but she totally said that at least a hundred times in my lifetime, right? It's like the full so Paul is using his like like you're in trouble thing. See, Peter, aka Cephas, is acting so differently around one group of people and so differently around another group of people that it's misrepresenting the gospel, that it's actually pulling people away from Jesus. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the people that put on the mask around church and they go, oh, you know, don't drink, don't smoke, don't run after girls, don't do all these bad things, all these legalistic things. And then they get home and they have the same addictions and same issues, but they pretend like they don't. They show one behavior, but they actually act very differently. But that's not the only type of hypocrite. As a matter of fact, it's not even the most common hypocrite we see here at the church. What, I, what we see most at the church is what I like to call the happy hypocrite. This is the like, life is great. I have this perfect home. I have these luxury cars. There's no drama in my life. Everything is perfect on the outside, right? And, and then they're always the person who's like, we need to stay more positive and lift each other up and really be supportive of everything. And, you know, just no drama in our lives because I hate drama. And then behind the scenes, guess what? There's drama, right? They're, they're the type of people that I would never act like them, whoever them is, right? Meanwhile, doing the exact same things that them is doing, but just behind the mask. Now, a lot of times this manifests itself in some specific, specific ways, like um, the, kind of the drowning in bills, right? They're, they're trying to live this certain standard. They're living outside their means. They've got to uphold this happiness and this perfect persona and this fake standard all while everything is great and life is great. And Jesus hated it. He hated it. And it's so easy to see in other people, and it's so difficult to see in ourselves. So pro tip, if you want to know if you're a hypocrite, one of the easiest ways to decide whether you have been hypocritical about something is you've, you find yourself continually saying, like, I would never act like them. I would, whoever them is, again, but, but, I'm sur but you're surrounded by thems. Right, you're surrounded by them season after season. The same people seem to keep following you around, and you never want to be a part of that drama. I would never do whatever they're doing, but yet that drama seems to follow you wherever you go, season after season, time after time. You know why? Because you're one of them, and your actions prove it. I love what Paul says when he's talking to Titus, and he speaks on the gravity of the role that uh, actions play, especially when it comes to our Creator and other Christians. Look at what he says. This is incredible. He says, They claim to know God. But by their actions, they deny them. In other words, as a good friend would say, I can't, I can't hear your words through your actions. Jesus despised this. Oh, he spoke so directly on it. He said, anytime, anytime that you're generous, just to be generous, like, like not just to be generous, but to be seen, right? Like they're like, look at how much I've given. Look at how generous I am. Look at how awesome I am. Look at how good I am. Jesus says, that's hypocrisy. Or the, as the Pharisees would do it, these are like New Testament bad guys, right? They would, they would get out on the street corner and they would pray and just look at me. I'm, look at how holy I am and look at how much I'm praying and look at all the great things I'm doing. Oh, man, and that is hypocrisy. But complete hypocrisy comes when you criticize somebody for doing one thing and then behind the mask you're doing exactly the same thing. Jesus never spoke more harshly than when people put on the mask, when people were a Hippocrates. A while back, I, um, I studied what's called the seven woes. This is, this is in Matthew's gospel. This is the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel. And time after time after time, Jesus would say, woe to you who, woe to you, woe to you who acts like this. Let me, let me show you some of the woes. This is so cool that he knew this so back then. It's not like he knew everything, whatever. It's just Jesus. He said, woe to you, G teachers of the law and the Pharisees. There's our bad guys. You hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you're full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. I can't even express to you how much of an insult telling a Pharisee that they're unclean is. He says, in the same way, on the outside you appear as righteous, but on the inside you're full of, there's our word, hypocrisy, which is essentially equated to wickedness. And then look at what he calls them. 
He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers. Some quick Old Testament should tell you that being called a snake, a.k.a. from Genesis, wouldn't exactly be a high remarks for a highly religious person. And then he asks them the question of questions. Look at this. This is incredible. He says, how will you escape being condemned to hell? It's that serious. What's so interesting here is that he doesn't say, woe to you who say bad words. He doesn't say, woe to you who, uh, you know, watch bad shows on Netflix every once in a while. He doesn't say, woe to you who do bad things. No, he says, woe to you who act like you don't. Who do the bad things, then act like you don't. Not woe to you who's imperfect. We're all imperfect. And I, I think this is so relevant right now because social media is this perfect breeding ground for hypocrisy. Wouldn't you agree? Right? Like, like you can all day long, and I don't want to rail on social media, but all day long, you can just post whatever you want the world to perceive you as. When in reality, it can be so much different. Right, that's the like the like. Look at my look at my perfect husband. Look at my perfect wife. We have this perfect marriage. We have these perfect kids. But reality is, you're not even sleeping in the same bed. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. What would Jesus undo? Or you're you know you're that person, and I'm not. I don't want to rail on anybody that does this, but like you know you like they have the perfect picture. You see these perfect pictures of like this morning devotional, right? And, and it's like perfectly framed up, so you can just read every little perfect note you did, and, and all the perfect handwriting, and you have the coffee mug in the corner because it's not godly unless you have a coffee mug, right? And then like you have this perfectly set up picture, and look at this amazing devotional that I did. But realistically, you spent more time getting the shot than you did actually in the devotional, spending time with Jesus. It happens all the time. And Jesus says, woe to you who do this. Woe to you who do this. How are you going to escape hell? Now, if you're a little uncomfortable right now, that's probably a good thing. Because it probably means that you have some self-awareness. Because I guarantee you there's people sitting in this room right now and under the sound of my voice online that are saying, I can't wait till so-and-so sees this. I can't, I can't wait to send this link to somebody. They're going to love to hear this. They need to hear this. They need to have this message in their life. And realistically, what they're telling me is that you don't have self-awareness. Because it's so easy to see it in other people. But if, you, if you're uncomfortable right now, that's, again, that's, that's probably, a, a, probably a good thing. Because it means that you, well... Probably have some self-awareness, but hopefully what it means is that you're open to hearing what the Spirit of God is going to show you and work on those inconsistencies. And what I believe I'm supposed to show you today on his behalf is that there's, a, there's, there's hope for all the hypocrites out there. There's hope for the hypocrite in you and hope for the hypocrite in me. So can I, can I, can I show you some hope as we, as we wrap up? Check this out. First John, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. We're, we're what? We're, we're a bunch of hypocrites. But if we confess our sins to him, here comes the hope. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from not some wickedness, all wickedness. But here's the catch. If we claim that we have not sinned, we're just calling God a liar. We're telling them we don't need him as a savior because we're perfect and we don't need him. And that his word has no place in our hearts. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, Jesus already told us in the woes. This is so good. It's like he knew. Because he did. He said, first, clean the inside of the cup and the dish. And then the outside also will be clean. Now, that seems a little counterintuitive from someone who doesn't do a lot of dishes. But, like, here's the thing. You're the dish. I'm the cup, you're the dish, you're the cup, whatever. What he's saying is, first, first, let the Spirit of God work internally in you where no one else can see it. Where no one else can see what's going on. Work internally in you and conform you to the image of Christ so that the Spirit of God begins to work up inside of you. And then, then and only then, out of an outflow and an overflow of what God is doing inside of you, you will become more and more like Christ on the outside. You'll begin to display His goodness. And it's not the goodness of you, and it's not the goodness of a show. It's not the goodness of an act. It's a goodness born out of God and born out of this world. And frankly... It becomes a reflection of what God is doing inside of you. 
And it starts, if I'm being completely honest, it starts with me. It starts with me. And so I, I want to I, I tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about, um, about when I started in ministry. See, I had a, um, a well-meaning, uh, he's actually a priest, but I called him pastor and a boss that always, he went, always wanted to teach me about what he called the pastoral mystique. And it's a mindset of pastors that have been, been going on for decades and decades and generations, and it probably continues to this day in places other than here. And it was, what it was is, uh, as a pastor, you always just had to keep up this image. You always had to be slightly above the people, kind of nose turned up slightly above the people, and you always, you always had to dress appropriately. You always had to you know, look the part. You always had to have the pastoral language. You always had to protect the pulpit, as he would say. And, it, oh, man, if you had any doubts, boy, you better keep them to yourself. If you, had, if you had any questions, no, you didn't have questions. Yeah, you had a bad day? There's no bad days in ministry. Keep it to yourself. And I said, okay, well, I mean, this is, this is who I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to do as a, as, as a young guy who wants to become a pastor. This is how I'm supposed to act. And I got to be honest with you, friends. I got really, really, really good at putting on a show. It was a traditional church. It was, it, I, would, I would get there, and, and you would put on these, well, they're called albs. They're just white robes, and then you would put this stole on. And we'd spend all this time getting dressed, and you'd have this necklace and this belt, and they would pray over each thing, and it was very specific and very legalistic and very painful. But I tell you what, it got you ready. It got you ready for the show. But to make it worse, do you know what I did? I'll be praying for your brother. I'll be, I'll, I'll be you know, contacting God on your behalf. And then I, then I never would. And then, and then it would, oh, you know, Ryan, like, how, like, what's God showing you in the word this week? And, oh, you know, too much to report, brother. Well, it's because I wasn't in the word. And I wasn't passionate about what I was doing. Now, I would, I would study to preach, certainly, because I didn't want to embarrass myself when I put on the show. But that's just what it is. And I found myself, and only through the grace of God did he reveal to me that I had become a full-time pastor and a part-time follower of Christ. And, and, and it, it got so dangerous. And you, you become so vulnerable. Because these, the, this lie and the show just consumes you in such a way. It got so, I was so depressed and so scared that I'd be found out. That, that, I, that, I, that, I, that they would know that I, what I was doing. And it makes you so vulnerable to doing something that is so incredibly wrong. Do you know why? Because sin grows best in the dark. And it's only through the grace of God that I became different. So maybe that's some of you right now. Maybe you're full-time mom. Part-time Christian when it's convenient. Or full-time business person. Man, I'm going to make that sale. I'm going to get that money. I'm going to do those things. And those aren't bad things. But only when it doesn't interfere, right? Like, you know, I, I can be a, I can be a full-time Christian except for when I need to make a sale on a Sunday morning. Or when I, when, when I need to do the work that I was supposed to do during the week, but I'm just going to push it off to Sunday, and I'll just, I'll just watch church from home and not participate. right? Or maybe, like, I wanna be, I'm going to be a full-time student. You know, I'm, I'm passionate about those grades and getting the job and getting in my career and stuff like that, but I'm not passionate about my Savior, the one who saved my soul. Maybe you maybe maybe you're not maybe you weren't being real the way I wasn't being real. And it just it spills into everything you do and consumes every part of your life. And finally, through the grace of God, I made the decision. I made the decision that I would rather be an honest sinner than a lying, deceptive hypocrite. Drop the mask. Drop the mask. Drop the mask. And be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. He already knows. And, it, and if you've been dishonest with somebody, and maybe especially been dishonest with yourself, come clean. There's a freedom to it. Allow God to start to speak into your life and work into your life. Because here's what I've learned. Here's what I've learned. That Jesus 
has zero tolerance for hypocrisy. He can't stomach it. He can't take it. it, it just, it's reviling to him, and it should be for you too. Jesus has zero tolerance for hypocrisy. He just can't take it. It grieves his heart. But as much as that, he has unlimited grace for a sinner in need of forgiveness. That Jesus can't stomach the show that we put on, but anyone who's hurting, anyone who drops the mask, anyone who comes to him and says, proclaims to him, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, save me. Jesus, change me. The answer is and always will be yes. You see, Jesus didn't come. He, he, didn't, he didn't come for the healthy. He didn't come for the, the, the righteous. If you're perfect, you don't need a Savior. But I don't know about you, but, but I'm not perfect. Jesus didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. He came for the people that are hurting inside. He came for the people that are dead inside. Who he came for is the sinners. Like you and like me. So here's my challenge for you today. It's twofold. One, don't be like me. Don't be like me. Be like Jesus. Don't be like me. Don't spend years putting on a show. And the second challenge is this. Find one area, just one, one area of your life where you've been dishonest. One area of your life where you may or may not have been a hypocrite. Maybe you've been dishonest to a spouse. Maybe you've been dishonest to a friend. Maybe you've been dishonest to a family member. Maybe you have put on a mask in front of your coworkers about whether, the fact that you're a Christian and what you do on Sundays. Maybe you've put a mask on in front of your, your friends or your family members and you're afraid to take it off because you're going to see exactly who you are. Well, guess what? God wants them to see exactly who you are and you are a Christ follower and so you need to show that to the world. And so find one area of your life. Just start with one. Take the mask off. Take the mask off and come clean. Focus. Instead, instead of focusing on the mask, focus on Jesus. And focus on the forgiveness and the healing and the change and the salvation that only he can give. Let's pray. God, I, I know far too much on this subject out of a lot of experience. God, I, I thank you for what you have taught on me, and I thank you for what you have continued to teach me on this. God, I would ask as, as we go about our day and we go about our week and we go about our month and our year that we would just never forget that while we may put on the mask, you know who we are. You know us better than we know ourselves because you are our creator. You are the author of our faith. And so, God, I ask that you would remind us to turn towards you. Do not focus on the mask. Do not focus on the fake. Do not focus on the show. Do not focus on the lies, but instead just to focus on you. God, and I thank you that when we do that, you are just with your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness every single time. God, I thank you for what you've done in my heart on this subject. I thank you for what you're going to do. I thank you most of all for your son Jesus dying on a cross that we don't have to spend eternity without you. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.